time. But there also he saw the woman of personified sin chasing him. This bitch followed him wherever he went. At last he very quickly went to the northeast and entered the Manasasarova lake. Saavasa Kushpuranala Tantun Alapada Bhogoyat Ihagni Dutaha Varshami Sasam Makshitunta Sanchitayam Brahmapadhat Vimoksham Always thinking of how he could be relieved from the sinful reaction for killing a Brahmana, King Indra, invisible to everyone, lived in the lake for 1,000 years in the subfibers of the stem of a lotus. The fire god used to bring him his share of Oryadyas, but because the fire god was afraid to enter the water, Indra was practically starving. As long as King Indra lived in the water, wrapped in the stem of the lotus, Nahusha was equipped with the ability to rule the heavenly kingdom due to his knowledge, austerity, and mystic power. <coughs> Nausha, however blinded and maddened by power and opulence, made undesirable proposals to Indra's wife with a desire to enjoy her. Thus Nausha was cursed by a Brahmana and later became a snake. Tatogatu Brahma Girupahuta Vitamvadhyana Nivaritagaha Papastu Rigve Tayo Hataujas Tamnabhya Bhut Indra's sins were diminished by the influence of Rudra, the demigod of all directions, because Indra was protected by the goddess of fortune, Lord Vishnu's wife, who resides in the lotus clusters of Manasasarovara Lake. Indra's sin could not affect him. Indra was ultimately relieved of all reaction of his sinful deeds by strictly worshipping Lord Vishnu. Then he was called back to the heavenly planets by the Brahmanas and reinstated in his position. O king, when Lord Indra reached the heavenly planets, the saintly Brahmanas approached him and properly initiated him into a horse sacrifice, a Shamiraya meant to please the Supreme Lord. The whole sacrifice performed by the saintly Brahmanas relieved Indra of the reactions of all his sins because he worshipped the Supreme Personality of God in the sacrifice. For King, also he had committed a gravely sinful act. It was nullified at once by the sacrifice, just as fog is vanquished by the brilliant sunrise. King Indra was favored by Marichi and the other great sages. They performed the sacrifice just according to the rules and regulations worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the superstar of the original person. Thus, Indra regained his exalted position and was again honored by everyone. In this very great narrative, there is a glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan. There are statements about the exaltedness of devotional service, there are descriptions of devotees like Indra and Vritrasura, and there are statements about King Indra's release from sinful life and about his victory in fighting the demons. By understanding this incident, one is relieved of all sinful reactions. Therefore, the learned are always advised to read this narration. If one does so, one will become expert in the activities of the senses. His opulence will increase and his reputation will become widespread. One will also be relieved of all sinful reactions. He will conquer all his enemies and the duration of his life will increase. Because this narration is auspicious in all respects, learned scholars regularly hear and repeat it on every festival day. Thus ends the Bhakti and the purpose of the six canto sentence, chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled King Indra afflicted by sinful reactions. So this story is indeed very popular. 
We used to have it as a habit on Sunday time and somebody was spacing out, you know, looking in a shopping window and was not concentrated. I came from behind and was going, wait, wait, you know. <laughs> you know, it would have, <laughs> and you remember that story because this witch is always behind us in a material world and form from sinful reaction. And sinful reaction is something really ghastly because it forces you to act sinfully. And that sinful action produces another sinful action, a reaction, and then you act even more sinful. And in this way, one is actually nicely degraded. Because living entities in the material world, they are all remote controlled. You know, once you enter that circle of karma, it's usually just a degradation. Unless there is not some offering of a higher nature to the demigods, and this there is no way up, it's always on the way down. Especially in Kali Yoga. You don't have to endeavor to go to hell, it's automatic. It's like the staircase, you know, you just enter your own subway and you go down. You don't have to walk, you just stand there. That's all. So Kali Yoga is like this, you just stand there. There were all these neutral people and pacifist people and peaceful people and ecological people and all these wonderful people. They all go to hell. <laughs> because why? There is no Vishnuyake. There is no offering. Nothing. They may go to hell in a less drastic way. Let's say automatic nice staircase, you know. They play nice music to it, you know, and you slowly go down. <laughs> you know, then there are those, of course, who cannot wait. They accelerate, you know. They, 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 there are really countries and places where they are so eager to go to hell. Prabhupada actually described it while passing by a disco in New York, you know. And then <laughs> from disco down there, it's always disco, it's never, it's usually down in a cell. You know, they, they hear the sounds, <laughs> you know, it's this beat, you know, coming out. And this Prabhupada was commenting, said, they zing, ho, 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 calling for Yamaraj, please come and take me. <laughs> you know, this was his Prabhupada related to sounds, actually. He could exactly analyze if it was a sound in a mode of goodness, ignorance, or passion. Prabhupada was very into it. It was so fascinating to be close to him because he could reveal an observation you would normally not get it, you know. Because we are so accustomed to this, you know, we think this is normal to live in Van Lose, you know, and hear the Muslim youth touring the mopeds through the night, you know. Or we think this is normal when people walk on the street and they just spit on the floor, you know. You know, we think this is normal when people open their mouths and all the brewery smell comes out, you know. And we think this is all like, we get used to it. This is a really dangerous thing, you know, in the world. Prabhupada called it, what do you call it? You get, uh, uh, you get, uh, well, you get accustomed to that. It doesn't appear to you so strange. Except for when uh, the devotees became devotees, or they manifested themselves as a devotees by the mercy of Sri Prabhupada, mm -hmm. the ec exciting feeling of, uh, you know, of what they actually experienced as transcendental, it was actually coming to the goodness. That's for us, coming from all of Tamagun, an exciting experience. We sometimes mistakenly think that goodness is transcendental. And we get hooked up on this. You know, we have to get purely for it. means to wash your hands. Never did before. You know, you know we have to get purified by uh, speaking normally. Not just, just vulgar curses. These languages which are just consistent with. Accumulation. American is very good for that. They, my God, they can speak the maximum of noxious words in minimum time. Completely normally. Just no problem. You know, I'm born in Czech Republic. They are also very good at it. They wish to pass by on the street, but a woman can say, it's just shocking. <laughs> what, did he, what did she say? In public? No problem. No problem. Communism is a shoot rising, you know. So it's very good, you know, to bring down everything, speech, thinking, everything is down, you know. People walk in filthy old dirty underwear and in broad daylight on the street. It's a typical communistic image, you know, yeah. 
It's completely normal. They lie on their car in underwear and fix underwear, you know, the car. This is a classical image. I grew up with this kind of pictures, you know. And, you know, and sometimes worse because they're really undressed. And they have a beer can and then a filthy underwear and then they just fix something. And, you know, and the speech is just this verbal vomiting. You know? So this is like, a, <laughs> you know, this is Kali Yuga. We are surrounded and you get used to this. You think, yeah, this is... You have men dancing, love parade on a street, homosexuals embracing and kissing. No, no, no. Even hundred years ago, I mean, there would be police right away there and say, what are you doing here? You know, now we don't want to go to the Victorian style where it was like, yes, madame, in tea time, madame. And then the madame was right anyway. <laughs> this was like, the English are really good in hypocrisy, you know. They are really like, yes, madame, yes. Yes, yes, and then they eat some head of a pig or something like this in a very cultured way. It's very nicely served. The lunch is served, you know. <laughs> they can be filthy and dirty and obnoxious in a most eloquent way. <laughs> and then there are nations, I don't want to insult the Denmark again, but you know, they, they are honestly degraded. You know, want to eat it? Eat it. It's the living, kill it. Boom! You know. You know, take the skin off and eat it. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> hey, woman coming. Oh, I raped it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> How many women did you rape today? <laughs> Very good. We are very happy people here. So this is like another culture. So Prabhupada didn't use the culture in connection with Western culture. So therefore Bhagavad Gita is so uplifting, like a story like this. Uh, because it's not only you know, as one of my colleagues said, it's the most makes Shakespeare looking like peanuts, you know, when you read this, just from the language point of view. The poetry involved here. What to speak of the depth of the philosophical depth of the understanding here. You know. At the best in the material world you find the so-called intellectuals, they are good in word jugglery, you know, and they just know how to express nothing with very eloquent words, and people think that's something here. Yeah. But actually, it's nothing because there is nothing in it. It gives you a, maybe some, you know, mental tickling. You know, you have books of this size. You read and you go, wow, that's far out. But then what? You close the book. Therefore, even books used to be published by the Bible in a way that they could be read for hundred years at least. Maybe even 500 years, you know, book you open and it was, it was really something. A book, you know, was brought out, you know, and read in a dark, long winter nights, you know, as people flocked around and they were hearing the pastimes of Lord Jesus. It was quite highly speculated, but that's another issue. But it was a book to be worshipped, really. Now, a book, you know, millions of them, and it's called paperback. You know, it's like more or less extended version of a newspaper. You know, you read it once and then you will never read it again. Who, do, who is studying the collected works of Harry Potter? You know, it's like, it's a big library, I tell you, it's quite a big book. It's just an, you know, an entertaining story. Ha <laughs> ha, wow, far out. And then close the book, never open it again. You know, therefore they didn't bother anymore to bind it because they, they, they know you will throw it away anyway. So what's the use of binding it? There's no even hardbound books, really. But you know, in a traditional sense, book was something which was carrying some charisma. You know, those really books, you know, <coughs> even of a mystical nature. You know, you, you, Robert said, actually, a real literature. <laughs> That's a really interesting thing. Prabhupada said, you read one word, one page, and your whole life has changed. That's called spiritual literature. Prabhupada said, even one word. And then he went even further. He said, even you don't read. You just touch it. It will have an impact. Some sort. Therefore, it's stated in Nectar of Devotion. You have this literature at home. You have Narayan at home. It's actually standing there on a shelf. That home is going to be afflicted somewhere. One book can change the whole atmosphere in a place. You know. And uh, people don't know what to do with that. They cannot relate to it. That's because they are so thickly covered. I just spoke yesterday to my 
friend in Czech Republic, he is actually uh, serving Sangitan devotees by getting all the books from the second hand shops. You know, there's plenty of them in Prague. So he, and he has an agreement with the owners, whenever the Hare Krishna book comes in, you give it to me. You know, so he's getting whole sets of Bhagavatams and this, and he keeps it, and then the Sankirtan devotees is passing by, they get books for free to distribute. Because he's running a restaurant, he has no time to go out. So, <laughs> people don't know what to do with that. They just have it at home. It's inaccessible to them, and we can also understand from Bhagavatam why. Because they are too sinful. I mean, look at Indra, what could he do? He just hiding in a stem of a lotus, you know, and waiting for the sinful reaction to pass by. You know, but, as we know, due to affiliation with Lakshmiji and due to affiliation ultimately worshiping Vishnu, that sin was dispersed. And this is the only chance we have. We cannot rise from the sinful battlefield we come from by the dint of academic studies, mystic power, or hard work, you know, except for it stated, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, I walk along, Kolonast, 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 Evakate Kanyata. And this Kolonast can be actually interpreted three times by not by hard work, not by uh, 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 academic jnana, not no karma, no jnana, and no uh, yoga, means mystic yoga. It doesn't work, especially in Kali Yuga, it doesn't work. Because we don't have simply that stamina, we don't have that power to sit under a tree, meditate, achieve mystic power and go. We fall we, we sit under a tree, we meditate and we fall asleep. That's Kali Yuga. Prabhupada said so many snoring yogis in India. They have a donation can there, you know, and people throw saying the person absorbed in samadhi under a tree and he goes. You know, and then he wakes up and looks if something is in the box. You know, and then he buys some, some, you know, some bidi. You know, yeah. I saw Chief Shaiva sitting <laughs> at the Ganga, you know, and they're just uh, smoking a joint, you know, with the tridents, and, and they feel back transcendental about it. <laughs> just a normal thing. <laughs> in India, they are so simple, they don't open even a disco or bar. They just sit at the river, you know, and get the high right over there. <laughs> And you don't have to go far to get anything. It's just blowing next to you, so you just, you know, <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> it is such, so, such a customary thing, as you can see from Prabhupada's childhood. His father uh, kept a hookah, you know, a water pipe, you know, at home for the guests, for the honorable spiritualists who came in, so they can smoke a little bit, you know, get a little bit high, you know. Because actually, that's probably not made it accessible to us because he knew, he knew this is going to be misunderstood. Definitely. But it's a fact that yogis do smoke out. Because as they say in Germany, hashish makes you very passive, but what do I care? You know, so, uh, you know, so uh, it makes your senses like dull. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> it's all fine here. Uh, I never smoke anything, and I never took drugs in my life, fortunately, but I saw the effects on others. It's amazing. When you see a happy, smiling people, it is high. You can sit in the middle of a total mess and go, hmm, try here. Because hmm. the senses become dull. It just, you know, makes you stupid. And stupidity, ignorance is bliss. That's the, you know, that's the motto in Kali Yuga. Let get yourself so ignorant that you don't even understand you go to hell. You don't understand what you do to others and you don't even feel what others do to you. It's a perfect state of samadhi. Because actually there is such a state in the original form on a transcendental platform where you are really immune to the influence of the material world but by a dint of a higher taste that you are so absorbed. It's actually a problem in the last stages of this last time seen on this planet, he was on his deathbed. His body was in a shape where the doctor said, this man should not live anymore. There is no physical reason why this man should live. You don't survive with half a kidney functioning, one, half a kidney, one and a half kidney is gone. That means there is no more purification in the body, the poison goes around and around, you know? Because <laughs> kidneys get filled. 
you know, and then the liver goes, and then <laughs> and the whole body is just disintegrating. Prabhupada was still preaching in this shape, translating, and giving, you know, speaking to devotees. Sometimes even stool came out of his body and went, oh, Prabhupada, we have to clean it up. He said, don't bother with this. This is more important what we are talking about. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, transcendental. It's just, yeah, it's not so, it's all in its body, you know. The body does so many things. In the material world, we are so trapped that not only physically, but even mentally, anything happening is of such an importance to us. Now, there is actually something called uh, hippiness and laziness and, you know, where you are not realized on that platform and still you don't care. Therefore, so sometimes, you know, an Abadhuta looks like a hippie, but he's not a hippie. You know, he is, you know, Prabhupada Maharaj once took his disciples after he killed, after Giranya Kashipu was killed. And so he took his disciples as the guru of the demons on a uh, study tour around the universe, visiting famous yogis and uh, transcendentalists, and you know, and they came upon this man who was just lying there in a ditch, quite fat, doing nothing. It's called Python Yoga. Python is a you know a snake which doesn't run any that much, just hangs on a tree, and once a month maybe something comes below the tree, and the python just falls down on it and chokes it. And then it's designed in such a way, you know, it digests the whole thing for one month, you know. <laughs> Sometimes they take a whole. I saw a picture of a python, it ate a wild pig, you know. <laughs> so python is like a tube and then there was this ball inside. It was, and it was peacefully digesting, yes. <laughs> you know. They can even extend the mouth by disconnecting the jaw, so they can swallow something really big. <laughs> you know? And then, you know. It came on its own, it was just passing by. So I just dropped on it and choked it. So this yogi was lying there quite fat. And Maharaj, <laughs> he was actually an elderly man at that time. He's not a small boy. So he just said, So, you know, I can see that you are a highly transcendentally advanced person, but I would have some very, I hope, not indiscreet question. Why are you so fat? I mean, you are yogi, you are supposed to be renounced, and you are so fat. And the man just lying there, he was really lying there, and he said, I don't know, I don't care. <laughs> Sometimes they come here, and they pick me up, and they feed me really nicely, you know. And they worship me, you know, oh, you divine transcendentalist, and say, Baba Ki Jai, or whatever. You know, and after a while, they carry me somewhere and they throw me in a ditch again. You know, they pass through on me and urinate. Okay, you know, this is fame, glory, you know, comes and goes. I think any guru can confirm that. <laughs> Don't sing when you become a guru. You just sit somewhere and to the end of your life and they just bring garlands. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> in Kali, where even your own disciple can threaten you by a court case. <laughs> Being a guru, guru is actually terrible service. It's horrible. You take the karma, they become blissful, puffed up, and then they get on your case. <laughs> I think uh, silently many Islam gurus will just give it around of applause to this statement. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Actually, it's terrible to be authority of anything in Kali Yoga. Because the first thing you get is always the criticism. That is the first thing you get in the face. And then once in a lifetime, somebody comes and goes, how do you feel? You know, just the question itself is shocking. You don't ask the manager how he feels. You're supposed to feel good and take all the nonsense in the face 24 hours a day. That's a management. You can come, kick him, he goes, thank you. He's a humble Vaishnava, you know. Then you can download any problem of your problem, problem you created is going to be his problem. That's a really privilege of Shudras. They love to make their own problems to other people's problems. You know, and then they go on the street, you solve my problem. I have a problem. I have to pay for the beer. There should be beer for free for everybody. Let's get, you know, together and march. Be it for free, be it for free, be it for free. 
for us we managed, you know, I, I can go like this because I was managing too long. But you know, but uh, <coughs> you know, managers should work hard like they should now. 24 hours a day, no sleep. He should be resourceful. He should create lots of money, good business, like a wife. And he should be heroically protecting anybody who is putting himself in danger by his stupidity, like a child. And he should be gentle, renounced, and full of knowledge like a brahman. If he is not, get him out! Let's vote another one. We are democracy here, you know? So who do you like? I think we like this one. Look, he, he looks like he could make lots of money and pay for us. Or he looks like the one who could bring lots of sense gratification. He looks like the one who could take all the sinful reactions so he can produce more. You know, that's a good leader. But such a person doesn't exist. By the way, wives have sometimes certain expectations of a similar kind. <laughs> could be exactly translated into a position of a husband. <laughs> On top of that, he has to be very beautiful. <clears throat> and very romantic. You know, and uh, very understandable, something which I don't understand in myself. Things like that. It's very important. Then you're a good husband. And you have to always fulfill the desires which I don't even know what they are. <laughs> That's a, he's a good husband. He really understands women because women never understand themselves. So, you know, so he can enter a mental platform, he can be super mental, and then he will manage. Anyway, there's some one word for this. It's called madness. Okay? Madness. Material word means madness. As Prabhupada said before he died, he said, everybody is mad. Then you look at his disciple, he said, you too, just a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> From a spiritual point of view, it's all just the existence of this material body is actually it's perfectly deranged. It's perfectly deranged because it's this is designed by the Supreme President of God. It's a result of our deranged desires. So what do you expect? If you have a deranged desire, you get a deranged body. But it's so perfectly deranged, it looks normal. We accept it as a reality. Hey, look, I speak and I spit. You know, there's wax coming out of my ears. It's very nice. There's a beard coming out of hair out of the most impossible places in this body. Uh, that's normal. Actually, as a matter of fact, a good man has lots of hair on the chest. For what? For what reason? Right? What is the hair doing on the chest? What's the purpose of the hair on the chest? I mean, what's the meaning? Logically spoken. But women sometimes which are actually a very powerful man. You know, in India, and it's very relative. In every country, they have a different concept of beauty. It used to be for, I don't know how, but in India, it used to be fat means beautiful. You know, the best is like bad. No, 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 they have to look like coming out of the concentration camp, then it's, then it's good. You know, when a woman is dressed in black and comes out, looks like she came out from the concentration camp, that's very really beautiful. In India, <laughs> I remember even when we saw first time on the airplanes, they showed us the first products from Bollywood. You know, they showed the stupid movies, and then Air India always used to. <laughs> it was the most painful aspect going to India. You sit there for eight hours and they would scream with this. Fat girls dancing on the snow in Switzerland. <laughs> ah, Krishna, you know, this is, my God, how much cheap it can get. You know, this India is really going to hell. You know? <laughs> I remember there was a film, a guy coming with an old sports car from 1942, driving up the hill at the Alps, you know, and then they come to the portion where there's a snow and they dance on it. And she is a little fat lady in a short pants dancing on a snow, you know, and his name was Arjun. You know, and we were like, what? <laughs> Fortunately, there's